Welcome to the lecture I and the group in the course Narratives We Live By in the University Minor Culture and Cognition. In the last lecture about creation and social order, I talked about the interpersonal aspect of narratives, the reliability of the teller, and the social role of narratives. In this lecture, we will first look into storing reality by the individual, which is done ad hoc as Storing reality is a skill that an adult person in human society of today is expected to master. And look into instances where the self has to change. There are various reasons why an individual has to change themselves, why and how change is enforced on them. This will also be the topic of the presentations in the seminar. We will then look briefly into the Mahabharata epic and then at the cultural context of the New Testament, and then into the story of the change that Enkidu from the Gilgamesh epic went through. Your assignment for this week will be explained at the end of the lecture. I will start with some short reflections about the question what a person is. The easiest place to start seems to the common sense, the sphere of biology. We are already used to the idea that uh, the majority of genetic material in all life is quite similar. So small differences are meaningful and the expression of the, this material is the name of the game and not so much the material itself. Further, the realization that our bodies or what we think of as our bodies host populations of other creatures as well. The bacteria that live in us, the trillion human cells body in which we live shares a space with 10 million bacteria cells. And lastly, our constant built-in companion creature who lives in most of our cells is the beloved mitochondrion, without whom our breathing effort would have proven useless. This is a joking way, of course, of saying that science is not as simple as it looks from the outside. Even in biology, of which the study object is close to us. But joking aside, this is one way to see the non-specificity of being human described by the theoretic cognitive strategy. Mixture, or what we perceive of as a mixture between humans and non-humans finds its mimetic expression in artifacts. Human body and lion face in the object on the right, a figurine made out of mammoth ivory, some 40,000 years old, we don't know what it means. And the one on the left from the Olmec civilization, the earliest known from the area of Mexico, of Mexico, uh, from the end of the second millennium BCE. They say that this is a shaman transforming into a jaguar. It is a shamanic practice to transform into an animal. Apparently, animals have some useful qualities that a shaman can use and therefore the temporary transformation. The mixture works the other way around uh, as well, as this uh, Sphinx uh, here shows. No idea why this mixture, but in the case of uh, Ganesha, we know exactly why he has an elephant head. Being decapitated by Shiva, the mighty Hindu god, the child's mother, Parvati, Shiva's wife, demanded that her husband restores the boy's head. Shiva sent out to find a head and ordered the first head uh, encounter to be brought and put on the child. And this was, of course, an elephant head. I'm not sure this helps very much in understanding the combination. The problem is not only of ancient cultures. The problem is not only of ancient, uh, the problem is not only of ancient cultures, as we can ask, why does this guy have predator's teeth? Here, actually, there's a very practical reason to puncture the skin in order to be able to get the blood easily. A more mythic type specification of a human is in traditions that tell, and it is a narrative story, that humans, as opposed to other animals or to animals, have a divine spark. And this makes them inherently ontologically different from simple biological creatures. In the modern period, rationality is what replaced the godly spark in humans as their unique quality. 
This ideology is changing in our times to the ecological ideology that directly counters it. Separating between humans and other is egoistic, and it is bad to be egoistic. And humans should see themselves as part of nature, or should we say see nature as part of the human semiosphere? As other animals are in fact invited into personhood, into the human legal system. Not sure how happy the chimps are about this. And not only great apes, but other mammals, as the dolphins and whales, uh, in this case, when the decisive factor is, the, is their sentience, that is, their ability to have emotions. This issue of emotions is interesting as a signifier of personhood. This is a relatively new thing to see emotions as such. This is done in a framework that sees emotions not as bodily phenomena, body pain reaction only, but as part of awareness of self-consciousness. The reflection on the bodily experience such as the increase of heart rate or sweating, and endowing this experience with meaning. And this is the modern way of looking at emotions. And if we mention the topic of self-awareness, you are probably aware that not only humans pass the mirror test, the visual self-recognition test, in which an animal is tested for recognizing itself in a mirror by being engaged with a mark it didn't know was put on her, the animal. This is a test of self-awareness and animals from a few families pass it, some primates, uh, mammals of other orders, some sea and forest mammals, some birds and some fish. But let us focus on the mythic cognition. This would, this would be the self, as the psychological field calls it which is constructed in a storied manner, not the physical experience of the self, that is the body which the brain manages, including its self-awareness, and not the categorized self, not the categorized self of the social institutions that label entities as self-units, but we will focus on the storied self. Jerome Seymour Bruner, who died in 2016, an American psychologist, was one of the first to point to the importance of, uh, of the story itself. He saw in narrative thinking a type of intelligence, and Donald knew, uh, knew his work and quotes him in his book. He emphasized the constructed nature of narratives. He was actually working with patterns from literary studies about genres and plot lines to talk about a variety of storied selves. He points to the narrative way of thinking as having its own logic, which is not logical, but a logic of a story. And he liked narrative thinking, saying that narrative teaches about reality as much as logical thinking does. We do not achieve our mastery of social reality by growing up as little scientists, little logicians, or little mathematicians. Brunner was certainly talking about mythic cognition. Mythic cognition is an acquired skill, but it becomes second nature. Sergei Korsakov was a Russian neuropsychiatrist from the 19th century. He described and gave his name to the Korsakov syndrome, an amnestic disorder caused by various deficiencies and is associated with the prolonged use of alcohol. The concept spontaneous confabulation refers to the spontaneous creation of an account of events that never happened in order to avoid admitting to something that is embarrassing. For our purpose, the important point is that adult humans in our civilizations are so skilled in conceptualizing reality as a story 
that they embark on storytelling without being aware of it. Similarly, spontaneous confabulation was described by Michael Kazaniga, a cognitive neuroscientist, in his experiment on split brain patients. Split brain refers to the medical intervention which disconnects the two hemispheres from each other in an operation, cutting the corpus callosum. This procedure used to be done, not very often, in epileptic patients as it was found to improve their condition. This is not done anymore, but at the time it was accepted that people could live normally after such a procedure, as they compensated for the lack of communication between the two hemispheres in other ways, such as through the vision capacity. Kozaniga made a series of experiments uh, with these patients, and here is one of them. He showed to the left hemisphere one object, chicken claw, and to the right one, another, a shovel. And then each hand controlled by the opposite hemisphere had to pick a card fitting to the object that it saw. The patients were then asked to explain why they picked the card that they picked. As you remember, the speaking capacity, the, the ability to explain is in the left hemisphere in most cases. Let's hear Gazaniga describing and explaining this experiment. And these patients uh, have been studied uh, on any of a number of tests for, for 40 years, uh, the, whole, the whole research program. And uh, about 25 years in, we asked ourselves the question, you know, what do these patients feel like when we kind of sneak into their right hemisphere and tell the left hand to do something? You know, it's, it's kind of like you're all sitting there now and all of a sudden you see your hand do something. What, what, you know, how do you, what do you say to yourself about that? How do you integrate that into you, where you are? And so literally after 25 years, we finally set up a test to say, we should ask the patients how they think about this sort of stuff. And so what we did was give what we called a simple concept test. And this is where we flash a picture again, here in the right visual field going to the left hemisphere, a picture of say a chicken claw. And then we have four choices out in front of the patient's right hand, the, the right hand getting its control from the left hemisphere. And uh, the correct choice, choice, of course, would be the chicken would go with the chicken claw. It makes perfect sense, very simple little test. And then to the disconnected right hemisphere, we show a picture of a snow scene. And the most uh, appropriate answer for the snow scene would be the shovel, okay? So we flash these pictures and uh, the patient is to pick the most appropriate uh, answer and the hands go out as you see in the cartoon. So the left hemisphere picks the chicken claw and the right hemisphere picks the shovel. So the patient's doing this, they're sitting there pointing to these things. And we said, in this case, Paul, why did you do that? And he said, oh, that's simple. The chicken claw goes with the chicken and then looking down at his left hand, pointing at this shovel, he says, and you need a shovel to clean out the chicken shit. <laughs> so immediately, immediately put into a context, an explanation for why a hand uh, uh, that moved, that came from his body, did something that it did. And uh, we have uh, umpteen examples of this. This experiment shows very clearly how second nature is storytelling in modern humans. Considering that the object of evolution is the population, it, the evolution, the personified evolution, invests most of its effort to accord the individual, the specimen, with the environment social environment in the case of humans and other social animals. And we have seen some tools that have been developed for this uh, purpose 
in the sociology week. But it does happen that an individual has to change from that into which it was socialized, mostly in the face of changing circumstances. But sometimes in cases of conflicting pressures. Persuasion for such change has to be induced and explained, and this can happen in various cognitive strategies. In terms of narratives, we would expect a plot where the protagonist recognizes the discrepancy between her or himself and the social expectations, the hegemonic voice behind the narrative, and would find a way to reconnect himself or herself to, to the expectations, and then go on fulfilling its role as a person integrated into the society. Such, indeed, will be the context of the three stories we encounter this week. The one about Enkidu in this lecture, and the two presentations, the conversion of Paul and the complaint of Arjuna. I will say a few words about the context of these uh, stories, of these two stories. The story of Paul is part of the New Testament. The New Testament entails that there was an older one, and yes, the, the New Testament is the second part of the Christian Bible, of which the Old Testament is the first part. This collection of texts tells the story of the life of Jesus on earth four times. The story is told four times, and then has um, numerous other texts. Many of those are letters of theological, moralistic, and supportive nature sent to early communities of Jesus followers throughout the Eastern Mediterranean. Some of these letters uh, were sent by Paul, St. Paul, if you want, Paul the Apostle, Paulus, or Saul, as he was first called. He was one of the founders of the early church and its great promoters. At first, Paul did not follow Jesus and was one of those persecuting him, but he eventually changed into being a follower of Jesus. How this change happened will be the story presented in the next seminar. The, the other story presented in the seminar will be from the Epos Mahabharata. This is an epos of more than 100,000 verses, one of the two great epics of Hindu India, uh, the other one being uh, Ramayana. It was compiled into an epos around 300 BC to 300 CE, yeah, not very accurate date, but this is how dates go in the uh, ancient past. Uh, it tells the story of the offsprings of two brothers kings, Dhritarashtra, and Pandu. Pandu dies and Dhritarashtra raises his brother's five sons, who are the Pandavas, yeah, from the word Pandu, Pandavas. Their names are uh, Yudhishthira, Bhima, Arjuna, Nakula, and Sahadeva. Arjuna is this one. Now, he's not the biggest of the brothers, but he is our hero. As they grow, the princes of the two families in enter into a conflict as to who should rule the kingdom. Here is a genealogical chart of the characters uh, in the Mahabharata. The ones in green are the Pandavas, on which side we are. A peak event in this epos is when the princes of the two branches stand one group opposite the other and prepare for the final fight, which will decide who will rule the kingdom. This is called the Battle of Kurukshetra. Arjuna is leading the sons of Pandu, and he is tortured before the battle, and out of his torture he talks to his charioteer, depicted here in blue. The story of this, which is the chapter from the epos called the Bhagavad Gita, tells about this conversation of Arjuna with his charioteer. We will hear more about this 
what was Arjuna's problem and how things ended in the next seminar. The story into which we will look in some details now is the story of the transformation of Enkidu from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Taming Enkidu, as this uh, story is called, is one episode from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the name of a king who is the main character of an Akkadian epic, which is based on earlier Sumerian stories. The Sumerian material is from the early 3rd millennium BCE. This is Sumer. Above the word Sumer, you can uh, find the city Uruk, uh, which, is, which is where Gilgamesh was king. The version we will read here is the Babylonian one from the library of King Ashurbanipal, a king of the Assyrian Empire from the 7th century BCE. Nineveh, see the arrow, is where the library was and was found. All the texts were found in archaeological digs. They were written in the cuneiform writing system in a number of languages. Cuneiform writing was done by pressing a soft clay tablet with a sharp tool and then burning it in order to make it uh, stable. This was done in ancient times by scribes of the temple. The latest academic translation was made by Andrew George, who prepared an edition of all well-known tablets of the story and also translated it into English. The story is set in the city of Uruk, so it is a story of ancient times already in the Assyrian period, as it was talking about an ancient Sumerian city. Very shortly, the overall story is about Gilgamesh the king, who is very cruel to his people. He tortures the young men and sleeps with the bride on the night of their wedding. The people then cry out to the gods, and the gods created Enkidu, a wild human, to be a match for Gilgamesh. Enkidu lives in the wild, and the way by which he is tamed will be discussed in a minute. But once he is tamed, he is introduced to Gilgamesh and becomes the king's mate. And Gilgamesh indeed stops his torturous acts. The two embark on a few adventures of winning over monstrous creatures and thus helping the people. In the end, Enkidu dies and Gilgamesh tries in vain to see him again. For this, he embarks on a journey to the netherworld and he tries to gain eternal life for himself, but in vain. I will not go into the details of this as we focus now on Enkidu. So here is a reading of this portion of the story. This is not George's translation as I couldn't find it read on the internet. This is an older translation by uh, Nancy Sanders, also an, um, a famous Assyriologist. I don't know who the reader is. It is from a YouTube channel called Ancient Recitations, which says about itself that here you will find ancient texts from around the world read in a clear British accent, in addition to analysis of texts and history-related news and events. The part that will be read starts with Aruru, the goddess of creation, creating Enkidu, and it ends with Enkidu being ready to meet and actually to challenge Gilgamesh. So the goddess conceived an image in her mind, and it was of the stuff of Anu of the firmament. She dipped her hands in water and pinched off clay. She let it fall in the wilderness, and the noble Enkidu was created. There was virtue in him of the god of war, of Ninurta himself. His body was rough. He had long hair like a woman's. It waved like the hair of Nisaba, the goddess of corn. His body was covered with matted hair, like Samugans the god of cattle. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of the cultivated land. Enkidu ate grass in the hills with the gazelle and lurked with the wild beasts at the water holes. He had the joy of the water with the herds of wild game. But there was a trapper who met him one day face to face at the drinking hole 
for the wild game had entered his territory. On three days he met him face to face, and the trapper was frozen in fear. He went back to his house with the game that he had caught, and he was dumb, benumbed with terror. His face was altered like that of one who has made a long journey. With awe in his heart he spoke to his father. Father, there is a man, unlike any other, who comes down from the hills. He is the strongest in the world. He is like an immortal from heaven. He ranges over the hills with the wild beasts and eats grass. The ranges through your land and comes down to the wells. I am afraid and dare not go near him. He fills the pits which I dig and tears up my traps I set for the game. He helps the beasts to escape, and now they slip through my fingers. His father opened his mouth and said to the trapper, My son, in Uruk lives Gilgamesh. No one has ever prevailed against him. He is as strong as a star from heaven. Go to Uruk, find Gilgamesh, extol the strength of this wild man. Ask him to give you a harlot, a wanton from the Temple of Love. Return with her, and let her woman's power overpower this man. When next he comes down to drink at the wells, she will be there, stripped naked, and when he sees her beckoning, he will embrace her, and then the wild beasts will reject him. So the trapper set out on his journey to Uruk, and addressed himself to Gilgamesh, saying, A man unlike any other is now roaming in the pastures. He is as strong as a star from heaven, and I am afraid to approach him. He helps the wild game to escape. He fills my pits and pulls up my traps. Gilgamesh said, Trapper, take back with your harlot a child of pleasure. At the drinking hole she will strip, and when he sees her beckoning he will embrace her, and the game of the wilderness will surely reject him. Now the trapper returned, taking the harlot with him. After a three days journey they came to the drinking hole, and there they sat down, the harlot and the trapper sat, facing one another, and waited for the game to come. For the first day and the second day the two sat waiting, but on the third day the herds came, they came to, down to drink, and Enkidu was with them. The small wild creatures of the plains were glad of the water, and Enkidu with them, who ate the grass with the gazelle, and was born in the hills, and she saw him, the savage man, come from the far off in the hills. The trapper spoke to her, there he is. Now woman, make your breasts bare and have no shame. Do not delay but welcome his love. Let him see you naked, let him possess your body. When he comes near, uncover yourself and lie with him. Teach him, the savage man, your woman's art. For when he murmurs love to you, the wild beast that shared his life in the hills will reject him. She was not ashamed to take him. She made herself naked and welcomed his eagerness. As he lay on her, murmuring love, she taught him the woman's art. For six days and seven nights they lay together for Enkidu had forgotten his home in the hills. But when he was satisfied, he went back to the wild beasts. Then, when the gazelle saw him, they bolted away. When the wild creatures saw him, they fled. Enkidu would have followed, but his body was bound as though with a cord. His knees gave way when he started to run. His swiftness was gone. And now the wild creatures had all fled away. Enkidu was grown weak, for wisdom was in him, and the thoughts of a man were in his heart. So he returned and sat down at the woman's feet, and listened intently to what she said. You are wise, Enkidu, and now you have become like a god. Why do you want to run wild with the beasts of the hills? Come with me, I will take you to strong-walled Uruk, to the blessed temple of Ishtar and of Anu, of love and of heaven there Gilgamesh lives, who is very strong, and like a wild bull, he lords it over men. When she had spoken, Enkidu was pleased. He longed for a comrade, for one who could understand his heart. Come, woman, and take me to that holy temple, to the house of Enu and Ishtar, and to the place where Gilgamesh lords it over the people. I will challenge him boldly. I will cry out aloud in Uruk. I am the strongest here. I have come to change the old order. I am he who was born in the hills. I am he who is strongest of all. The picture you see here is from a cylinder seal impression of probably Gilgamesh on the right, clothed and crowned, and Enkidu on the left, half naked, to make uh, uh, to typify his wildness. 
they both attack a monster called the Bull of Heaven. So how did Enkidu transformed and uh, tamed into civilization, into developing his full potential as a human? First, we should recognize that this was not his own initiative. It was the will of the gods behind the scene, and it was their plan. Overall, it was a scheme that was played against Enkidu, a plan to lure him into civilization. And the person chosen to do so was a harlot. A harlot is not exactly what we call a prostitute today, although it is a woman whose profession is sex. But she exercised her profession as part of, his, of, as part of her role as a priestess. Priestesses were working in the temple. They belonged to the temple. And part of their role was to have sex on various occasions. For example, uh, in the Akitu festival, in the beginning of the year festival, the role of the priestess was to have sex with the king to ensure a fertile year. So she's a woman of high society in the sense of one who knows the culture and one who knows how to manage people as she walks around in high circles. The demand of Gilgamesh and the trapper for Shamha to take off her clothes and seduce Enkidu was to present Enkidu with something that first he would not be able to resist and second will leave an irreversible impact on him. The level on which Shamhat approached Enkidu was a mimetic level. The nonverbal international bodily action on her part was what Enkidu found irresistible, being a nonverbal uh, person himself. We don't get the details of what happened there, or we actually do get some details, but the, the meaning of them is not very clear. We hear of six days and seven nights, and we hear of murmuring love, and that she taught him the woman's, the woman's art. I'm especially intrigued by the murmuring. Surely Enkidu could not speak, as he lived with nonverbal animals. And surely by the end of his stay with Shamhat, he could speak, as they hold a conversation. So this is one of the things he learned from her. Other aspects of the transformation, I'm quoting now. So wisdom was in him and the thoughts of a man were in his heart. So far the quote, and this made his body weak. So it is not the body of man itself, which is weak. It is wisdom, which makes the body weak, intervenes with the actions. I think it is a nice description even though not, not absolutely clear? Is it doubt? Is it reflection? Is it extra cognitive strategies which, which stop actions? So now animals do not accept Enkidu anymore. And Shamhat knows to appease his loneliness by complementing his wisdom. So it is not a source of weakness now, but a source of his divine nature. So it seems that originally the transformation proved uh, not very advantageous for Enkidu, as all his friends uh, left him. But this disadvantage was corrected by words, by a narrative. As Enkidu was now led, if not to say manipulated, into wanting to meet Gilgamesh. Mission accomplished as far as the gods are concerned, and subsequent relief for the people of Uruk. But was Enkidu happy about this? The story of uh, Gilgamesh is not interested in answering this question directly, as the rest of the story focuses on the pair, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, and later, after Enkidu's premature death, on Gilgamesh alone. The picture here is of an uh, Inuit art. Uh, for your assignment, please tell a story of a personal change, a real life story, not necessarily yours but one that you have encountered and tell in which cognitive strategy did the incentive for the change arise? Was it mimetic, like the case of Enkidu, mythic or theoretic? 
submit your answers in the assignment link below uh, the lecture and see you all in the next seminar.